Welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're so excited to kick this webinar off um, about biosensors in performance and training. Uh, we have a great set of panelists here for us and we can't wait to get started. We'll get started in just a minute, but I just wanted to give some housekeeping things just so everyone's set on what you can do. Uh, my name is Kate. I'll be moderating over the course of the hour. So I will be sort of surfacing questions to our panelists and uh, moderating the, the question box. So if you see in the corner of your screen, there's some questions that you can submit. So just send those along. Anything you're curious about over the course of the hour that this raises, we will aggregate them and send them up um, and be answering them. And then I just wanna mention also that all uh, registrants, including people who may have missed this webinar or have to drop out early, for example, you will receive a recording in 24 hours. So do not worry about that. It'll be in your email, the email you signed up to attend this webinar with, and uh, that should be fine. On that note, I think I'm going to pass it over to Nam, who will do the introductions. And I'll um, turn my screen off or my camera off, and then I'll just pop up periodically when, uh, when we have questions. So take it away. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Kate. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Nam. I'm a neuroscience product specialist with iMotions, and I'm lucky enough today to have with us a very special guest, Dr. Derek Mann uh, from Jacksonville uh, University. Uh, Dr. Mann is an assistant professor of kinesiology at the Brooks, Brooks Rehabil Rehabilitation College of Healthcare Sciences. Um, he, and he has more than a decade of experience and service in the private sector, working with high-performing athletes, military, and corporate executives. Um, he's also served as an adjunct professor at the University of Florida, Troy University, and Sheridan College. Um, he's an expert in the mental, emotional, and attentional aspects of human performance, and is specializing in the perceptual cognitive expertise and performance in high-stress environments. And uh, his research is supported by an extensive publication list, including numerous journal articles, book chapters, and books. Dr. Mann, thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited about today's topic. Absolutely. Um, so before we get into the uh, the details of your research, uh, it might be useful to kind of give everyone in the audience a little bit of an overview about like the current state of the technology and the tools that uh, we'll be sort of describing today, uh, and then and how they're actually used to match performance and, and the training environment. Um, if you're not already familiar with iMotions as a company, um, we are a software company that has teams of software developers as well as neuroscientific application specialists such as myself. And we've been able to help our clients integrate and accelerate their research using tools like eye tracking, um, facial expression analysis, uh, brain waves with EEG, heart rate analysis with ECG devices, uh, electrodermal activity, as well as a variety of other tool sets that are out there. Um, we work in a wide variety of different verticals and uh, are able to help, help our clients sort of get the deeper insights in the way that they're uh, doing their research. Um, some of the, art, the research verticals that, that we've uh, worked with and uh, are lucky enough to uh, bring into this uh, for you were uh, academic laboratories such as psychology, communication laboratories, uh, to uh, industries such as media, consumer goods, financial services, and such as well. Uh, the common theme that all our uh, clients are looking for is they're looking to try to unpack sort of the, the human experience a little bit more in the way that they're going about these. Um, David and I, who is uh, also here on the webinar, are part of uh, what we like to think of as the human performance team, Go Human Performance Team, uh, where we've uh, worked with a variety of verticals, uh, including um, uh, government and military applications, uh, medical spaces, as well as a, a, a number of uh, sports applications from um, college up to professional to, to sports apparel companies even. So why biometrics? So what we're able to do is that we're able to tackle a wide variety of different use cases, whether it's usability, developing products, the way that people are experiencing different types of communication efforts. And then when they're inside a training environment, uh, how does that actually then apply to those different types of tools? So why um, are these companies and our, our verticals, including um, sports training, turning to neuroscience as a way to answer their questions? Well, uh, traditionally in the past, um, we, we have a variety of different types of, uh, of, of methodologies, such as just doing self-reports or observational-based uh, methodologies. Uh, but they're looking for an additional need for data. And what data gives them is an increase in the consistency and the repeatability of their uh, of their data and insights into the way that they're going into it. Um, but the biosensors that they can use can then 
uh, extend traditional methodologies and, and give sort of a, an additional layer of insights uh, in order to explore beyond that self-report measure. Um, and by increasing uh, in consistency and, and capabilities, they're able to then understand at a deeper level what's going on. Um, I give an example of, a, say there was someone that was interested in writing a really good book, going around and asking people, well, what's the last good book that you read? And which is very tantamount to traditional methodologies there before. Um, that person might be able to, to report to you, oh yeah, I read this really good book. Uh, well, what are some of the scenes that kind of drove that, 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 that positive experience? And that person might uh, be able to report one or two experiences based off of their, their memory, uh, but it's limited by what they can recall. Uh, by using uh, neuroscientific approaches, then you might be able to get insights like, oh, well, you know, tell me every single page that something interesting happened and give me a uh, uh, precise intensity rating or uh, other ratings that actually kind of uncover that type of information which will provide a much deeper sort of insight into the way that that story drove that human experience. Uh, but pro by providing this type of uh, methodology towards a variety of other cases, including sports performance research, we're able to then uh, unpack those different levels of cognitive processes. So what cognitive processes uh, are, are out there that we're looking for? Um, well, there's a number of ones that are out there that, that can be, you know, affecting those different types of, of workloads and choices out there, depending upon which tools that you're looking to try to bring to the, uh, to the foyer. Uh, there are things like uh, EEG that are out there that can get a sense of things like cognitive workload and other types of choices. Um, each of these can kind of give you sort of the, a different sort of amount of that Venn diagram of human behavior in order to measure that human experience. Uh, there's things like skin conductance that can uh, give you information about uh, how aroused they were or what information was important when it came up at the time, amount of time. Um, there's tools like surveys, of course, that are, are still out there and, and are critically important to be added into in order to get that, that perceptual uh, um, feedback from, from their point of view, as well as other tools like eye tracking and facial expressions that are out there in order to drive things like, you know, how do they pay attention? What did they pay attention to? Um, what uh, types of reactions did they have and in, in going into it? Um, iMotions being a, uh, uh, you know, a integrator of so many different hardware sets, uh, we're able to then leverage a wide variety of different tools in order for you to uh, get a sense of those things. And these can be from, um, you know, eye tracking bars that you place on a computer to uh, eye tracking uh, glasses out there in the field. Uh, somebody's typing really loud. Um, if, could they mute that on the, on the broadcast? Thing? Thank you very much. Um, to, to other types of devices out there, um, different types of things have sort of in the recent um, development cycle uh, come to be much more portable and usable in the environment. So things like skin conductance can be measured with watch lights devices, which you can place on your hand and get a sense of that, that arousal. EEG can now be done uh, wirelessly uh, with uh, caps and transmitters that, that send signals to a, to a laptop. Um, eye tracking glasses uh, can then get a sense of whether they're looking at out in the out in the field in the real world uh, to get a sense of what they're looking at in addition and not be tied down to a, a specific computer there. Now the question is then how uh, do we actually then apply this to the area of, uh, of sports performance and measurement? And so uh, there's a famous quote by Yogi Berra saying that the game is 90% mental and the other half physical. So uh, great baseball player, uh, not great mathematician. But what we can see from, from what this is hinting at is that there are a wide variety of different uh, sort of processes that can affect the way that someone performs out on the field. Uh, and a lot of them are affected by these different uh, states, such as motivation, uh, different cognitive workloads, uh, perceptual effects, stress, emotion, uh, performance history. And so we all heard of these things about like going on tilt or, or going on a streak and getting hot. And so, you know, what are these things that are sort of affecting the way the player performs uh, mentally into the these actions that they have practiced? Uh, luckily, we, you know, that's why we're here today to actually ask Dr. Mann uh, exactly how these are sort of applied in their field before. But uh, the use of neuroscientific uh, processes and, and approaches in order to look at these things aren't 100% uh, new uh, in here before. 
Um, there's been a variety of different previous applications. Uh, you might be familiar with, like, say, these eye trackings with uh, Ronaldo here, looking at the way that they he uh, sort of looks at the ball and, and assesses that type of behavior. Uh, to heart rate measurements, which is uh, you know very common in the industry as well, muscle contractions, EEG uh, less so, but I think it's it's actually coming into uh, more and more as the technology evolves, as well as things like um, you know. Uh, arousal management with uh, electrodermal activity, which can give you a sense of exactly how far into the uh, stress performance spectrum that they're going into, as well as facial expression tracking. Now, how do these tools actually then apply directly to uh, sports performance and training itself? Uh, so here we have, um, we're gonna do a quick poll with our audience to see uh, how many of you out there are actually have used this type of uh, methodology before in the past. So let's go ahead and just give you uh, a minute there to answer this poll as it comes up. And it's okay if you've never used it before. I just want to get a sense of exactly, uh, you know, how our audience is sort of uh, cross-sectioned across these different experiences. Dr. Man, before um, you actually uh, did this, you have a, a long history of, uh, of use in these uh, areas as well, right? I do, yes. Yeah, we'll, we'll get a chance to talk a little bit about some of that experience, both uh, from from a research perspective, more laboratory based research and as well as some applied applied research as well. So Kate, how are we doing? Yeah, we've got um, almost 75% uh, voted. So I'll just leave this up for another second. Um, it looks like the majority of the audience is completely new to this field, which is super exciting. Um, we love to share the knowledge. And uh, about a quarter of you guys have uh, experiment, experimented with it, but are still considering um, themselves to be new. So lots of opportunity for growth here, and we hope that we can answer some of your questions and curiosities. So uh, let's go ahead and close that poll, and we'll get back to the presentation. Thanks a lot for okay. voting. Thank you so much. We'll be able to present to you the results of that poll, uh, hopefully at the end of this uh, presentation. Uh, for the next part, uh, we're going to go ahead and transition into some questions for Dr. Mann. I'm going to actually introduce uh, David Schulman, who is the head of sales for the Human Performance Training Team. And uh, to see if, um, go ahead, David. David, you're muted. <clears throat> Hi, David Schulman here. I work really closely with NAM and our team of uh, PhDs and product specialists to really help understand uh, the market space and, and how iMotions can fit within that. So glad you could all be here today. So the first question for Dr. Mann is, what, what, do you, what do you think are some emerging research areas in sports performance research? And what are the questions we can ask with, par with current sensor technology? Yeah, thank you, David. And uh, just just a quick aside, David and I've had a chance to to collaborate and work uh, pretty closely together over the last couple of years, and very much appreciate all your support. So uh, so thank you for that, David. Um, yeah, it's a great question. I, th I think when uh, one of the first things that comes to mind when we talk about emerging trends here, and Nam, you you sort of alluded to this earlier, is there's a the subjectivity objectivity kind of distinction. There's certainly a subjectivity bias when we're asking our athletes how they feel prior to competition. Do you feel confident? Do you feel ready? Are you nervous? Are you anxious? Now, depending on who asks that question, uh, it's going to very much influence the type of answer you get. So, for example, when you think about a coach asking that question before a game, most often an athlete's going to let the coach know that they're very confident and ready to perform, of course, for obvious imp implications. So, I think one of the one of the emerging trends here is for us to help to truly understand what our coaches and athletes are experiencing um, both subject, sub, subjectively, but also objectively. And, and this is where I think a lot of the biosensors really help us uh, to better understand the athlete experience, what they're experiencing prior to competition, during competition now. Uh, as a quick aside, there's some really interesting um, advancements that the NCAA has allowed for where we can actually wear some biosensors provided it's for gathering performance metrics during competition, not for a performance enhancement perspective during competition. So we can actually start to learn more about what, what our athletes are experiencing uh, during competition, which is really fascinating. So with, with that being said, I think uh, the goal 
is to is to really understand where our athletes are coming from from a variety of perspectives. And with that, I think there's a, a there are a number of emerging trends. The the first trend that I'm seeing, and, and we've been really fortunate to be able to jump in on this a little bit at Jacksonville University, and that is from a psychophysiological perspective, really trying to understand how an athlete is feeling or what they're um, physiologic, psychophysiologically, so mentally and emotionally and physically experiencing prior to competition. What are they feeling post-competition? But most importantly, combining all of this information to look at recovery. And uh, so I think when we, one of the, the, the real emerging aspects of both in laboratory research and applied research is how can we help our athletes recover quicker um, and more efficiently? And most importantly, looking at this from an intra-individual perspective. So how do I as an athlete differ from my teammate? We, we both experience the same amount of work, the, the same workload over the same number of days, but I'm not recovering as well as my, as my teammate, why not? And uh, so from a psychophysiological perspective by monitoring EEG activity, heart rate activity, more specifically even heart rate variability, uh, we're, we're able to better understand some of these differences. And part, of, part and parcel with that is not to exclude the subjective responses, right? So asking our athletes what it is they're thinking and feeling, but then to combine that with how their body's reacting. And uh, so that's one, one area that's emerging. I think a, a second area that is not necessarily new, we've seen a lot of research here over the last arguably three decades, and that's in the world of perce perceptual cognitive expertise. And, uh, but what we are starting to understand is based on the, the, the foundational research that has allowed us to, to infer that expert athletes not only respond faster, but more accurately in, in complex environments, they, if we look at their visual search characteristics, if we, if we start to understand uh, from their perspective, how are they taking in information from the environment around them? They use fewer fixations of longer duration, meaning that they, can, they know what to look at and when to look at it and for how long. And in turn, that translates into greater response accuracy uh, and response time. And that's, that's a characteristic that we've seen fairly robustly researched and presented over a 30 year period. Um, Mark Williams uh, and, his, and his team have demonstrated this robustly. And uh, about 10 years ago, we published a, a meta-analysis that really looked at this literature in totality. And it was clear, experts outperform near experts and clearly outperform novices in the, their, their visual search characteristics. And that again, represented by fewer fixations of longer duration, knowing what to look at and when to look at. One other element of perceptual cognitive expertise that came out was this idea of quiet eye. Now you had a question. Uh, so before we uh, go into the, the quiet eye, which I definitely want to go into, uh, perhaps it might be useful to uh, quickly just define uh, what you mean by fixation for those of you that aren't familiar with uh, that terminology. Uh, so uh, fixation is a term used in the eye tracking industry to describe a certain set of eye behaviors. So uh, if you actually look at the way that the eye moves, uh, there's uh, times that they actually stop to look at something and your brain is actually processing that. And there's times that it's just sort of ballistically moving around to acquire the next target. And so the fixation is an actual term used in order to actually look around. And so when Dr. Mann describes his uh, fixation uh, points, that's what he's looking for is that that first time that something actually stops to look at, say, uh, a particular object or actually then moves into it. Yeah, thanks for clarifying. And, and it's an important distinction because as you as you just in, in implicitly know, as our eyes move around in space and they jump from A to B, there's a, a, a behavior called a saccade. And that saccade actually um, renders us blind. We cannot see information. We cannot process or take, take in information during that saccadic eye movement. So the only time we process information is when our eyes lock in on, a, on, on, a, on an area of interest, a subject of interest, and then we process it. And that's, that's the, the real relevance of fixations. So to that point, one of the things that we know is intermediates or novice athletes, they have more saccadic movements, meaning their eyes jump around their environment more randomly or haphazardly, meaning less time to actually systematically process information. So from a perceptual cognitive expertise realm, the question now isn't, you know, what separates experts from novices? We get that, we understand. So now the question is, can we train it? And uh, so this is becoming an emerging, emerging area in the field. And that is, can we actually teach the environmental cues that are most important for an athlete to perform better? So in other words, after, years of deliberate practice, can we take an intermediate athlete and get them to expert status faster 
then have, have we not engaged them in perceptual cognitive training? Which leads to a second area or a third area, really, that's a, a hot emerging topic. And this is really out of Joan Vickers' world, uh, and that's the perception and action. And this is really where we're teaching, uh, we're taking the, the eye tracking information out of the perceptual cognitive world and now translating this into decision making. So, what information can we teach our athletes? So, for example, come back to this idea of quiet eye that I was alluding to earlier. Quiet eye is known as the final fixation before movement onset. So, for example, in a self-paced task, you might look, you might look at a, a sport like golf with a, a putter, for example, or a golfer getting ready to putt, a marksman who's honing in on their target right before trigger pull, a basketball player getting ready to execute um, a jump shot or a free throw from the field. So those athletes will find an instrumental target. So if it's the basketball players you may see on this video here, a good shooter will find a clear spot on the back of the rim and they will hold, hold that focus point, that final fixation on that target through release. And arguably, the longer that quiet eye period or that final fixation is before they execute the jump shot or free throw, the more successful they'll be. So now the question is, can we train athletes to identify cues in the environment that will effectively guide their behavior? So now not only can they make better decisions and make them faster and more accurately, but they can also move more precisely, and which ultimately translates into enhanced performance. We see this with Joan Vickers and her, her seminal research with basketball free throw shooting at the University of Calgary, all the way to contemporary research with, uh, with marksmen and golfers in, improving their golf putting. You know, a really neat example of this um, was, was more tacitly with, uh, with uh, oh gosh, it was a, a female golfer on the LPGA Tour, and for the life of me, I've just drawn a blank. But uh, it, was, it was very interesting where one of the, uh, the, 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 the uh, on-course commentators had just given her some novel advice at one point. Excuse me, Lexi Thompson is, uh, is the player's name. So apologies for the, the, the drawing a blank there. But so Lexi Thompson was, was in competition and, and post round she was in an interview and one commentator just simply said, hey, you know, something that might help your putting is putting a mark on your ball to give you something to focus on while you're putting. Well, inherently, that's actually where perception and action is, is really making, making its mark, no pun intended, is because by putting that mark on the ball, it directed Lexi's attention externally to the cue that was most important. And that was the intercept putter head and ball and that translates into performance enhancement um, and again we're seeing that in, in plenty of research so there's a, another hot topic uh, I think another emerging topic that's arguably pretty sexy right now is this idea of sport vision training we're seeing a lot of um, vision clinics uh, and sports scientists in particular interested in trying to tr to to train or enhance the visual system in other words, can we pick up cues faster or can we enhance our visual acuity? And so then the question here really is, is it a hardware issue? So in other words, the, the ability of our eyes um, to process information, to see, see cues clearly, or is it a software issue where the information coming in through the visual system gets processed in our brain rapidly so we can make decisions? Now, I think the simple answer here is it's a combination of both, but ultimately what's driving the bus? What, where's going to be the biggest bang for our buck in terms of research and applied investment? Is it going to be on the hardware side or on the software side? Now, depending on the seat you sit in, I, I think there's going to be a bit of a bias here. Now, as a cognitive psychologist or cognitive researcher, you might look at it and say, well, clearly it's going to be software. The more we train information processing, the better we're going to be, et cetera. Now, if you sit in an optometrist or an ophthalmologist's office or in their seat, they're going to look at it and potentially argue that it's a hardware issue. Let's correct any visual deficiencies, et cetera. There's some really interesting research that came out of Australia with crickets, cricket batsmen. And, uh, and I think this is really fascinating. The, the research team actually induced a progressive blindness on their, on their cricket batsmen up to the point of legal blindness. And hitting performance did not seem to be adversely affected or impaired, if you will, until those cricket batsmen reached a point of legal blindness, which, again, one study, understand it, but it certainly speaks to this notion that if I know what to look at and when to look at it and for how long, and I have 
tremendous amount of experience doing that, I may be able to circumvent some of my visual deficiencies. Now, there's plenty of research that might suggest otherwise as well. Um, so, so nonetheless, this notion of sport vision training is a sexy topic um, that we, we need to dig into further, not only from a mechanistic perspective, but also from an applied perspective. And then I would argue, lastly, um, th this topic is an age-old topic, but given the advancements in technology, including biosensors, is really understanding the realm of, of mental toughness and performance under pressure. Uh, coming back to the point we were talking about earlier, this notion that athletes are going to oftentimes tell us what we want to hear because there's an ego investment. So how can we circumvent that to truly get at what an athlete's experiencing? Uh, I think Jim Blaskovich and his colleagues out of the University of Santa Barbara really delved nicely into this area of the biopsychosocial model of challenge and threat. And that is, depending on how we see the, the task. So, for example, if I view the task that I'm about to engage in as a nice match to my current knowledge, skills, and abilities, I will see that as a challenge environment. And therefore, mentally, emotionally, physically, I will be better primed to perform at my best as opposed to perceiving that task as a threat, meaning that my perceived knowledge, skills, and abilities don't quite meet the demands of the task. In that case, my, my psychophysiological makeup is quite a bit different. And uh, so by using biosensors, we can better understand, for example, looking at cardio, cardiovascular output, heart rate, or even heart rate variability, we can start to better understand what our athletes are experiencing, not only in a training environment, but how they perceive competition as well. So, so again, here are a number of really rich emerging areas um, that I think advancements in biosensor technology is allowing us to really peel back many layers of the onion to better understand the athlete experience, um, and then ultimately how we can enhance athletic performance by circumventing some of the arguably some of the psychological challenges that, that athletes or information processing challenges that our athletes face. Thank you so much for, for that. Uh, why don't we move on to question two? Sure. David, uh, you're on mute again. Sorry. <laughs> Dr. Mann, how, how have you approached this in your own research? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I'll, I'll just preface this by saying, I, I, as much as I love controlled systematic research, I'm, I'm really an applied researcher at heart. And so, so I do struggle at times with finding that balance between, you know, good empirically derived controlled laboratory based research and then translating that to the, to the application field or to the athletic field. So, I, so really I've done a little bit of both. Um, you know, if we, if we think mechanistically, one of the things that I've, I've really been interested in over the course of my career is understanding what's happening mechanistically when athletes perform at their very best versus when, when they're not necessarily choking, but when they're off just a little bit. What's, so for example, if we look at a golfer, what's the difference between that, that great putt and it's a hit or a really good putt that translates into a miss? What's the difference? And can we actually start to understand what's happening um, mechanistically. So in this case, looking at what's happening in the brain, what is also happening visually, visually and spatially. And, and to me, this is where uh, a nice integration between EEG research. So uh, for example, we use a, the Anovio 8 headset, uh, which is great for, for being able to capture uh, uh, portable data. So we can actually get a golfer out on a, on a practice tee unencumbered and, uh, and they, we can see what exactly they're doing. But we can also measure eye tracking. And so one, one study in particular that we had conducted a few years back was really looking at, is there a relationship between what's happening visually and what's happening in cortically or subcortically in the brain that matches to allow us to better understand what's happening with a, with a golfer and their level of performance. And so one, one mechanism that, uh, that is, is really been an area of interest is in the, in the region of the brain in the premotor cortex. And that is the Brichas potential, also known as the BP. And arguably, the Brichas potential is where a requisite motor program is being elicited and then evoked to guide movement once a decision has been made to, to execute a task. Now, so with that being said, what we are interested in is this idea of quiet eye. So quiet eye, again, the final fixation between before movement onset. So if we looked at a golfer and a golfer had nice quiet eye, 
So in other words, they were focusing on the back of the ball or a blade of grass with a soft fixation to that point. Would the length of that quad eye correlate with the, the size of the peak or the magnitude of the motor program being, being elicited prior to the stroke? And if so, does that translate into better putting performance? And interestingly enough, the answer, the answer was yes. Um, so one theory to help support quad eye is as our visual spatial processing focuses it on the most relevant cues, our verbal analytic processing shuts down. So we have right brain activation, left brain quieting, and our premotor, premotor cortex is being activated in terms of the BP. Then we're seeing almost an optimal pre-performance window to be at your best. So with that being said, what we found was golfers who, let's say expert golfers, expert golfers when they were successful, had a successful putt, they had greater BP, greater quiet eye, greater accuracy on their hits than when they, when they, with their misses. What we also found was intermediate players, when they were successful, their quiet eye and their BP was more similar to that of experts when they were successful. But the difference was when the intermediate players had a miss, their misses looked a lot more like a novice player. So intermediate athletes are closer to expertise, but there's still a lot of noise in the system that, that has to be overcome. And we can talk about a number of theories that, that might, might help explain that. But there's a mechanistic account of some of the work that we're doing. I, I also, sorry, go ahead. Was there a question there? Yeah, I'll just pop in here. This is Kate. I'm going to share my screen again. Hey, um, we actually have two great questions from the audience that I'd love to surface before we move on. Um, the first one is about um, Broadman areas or Broadman. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce it, but uh, our question is, is it possible to map, map out specific Broadman areas being activated during a cognitive exercise using an EEG headset? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, now, from my perspective, I, I don't know that we can necessarily map out specific areas of Broadman's region with EEG. I think we're gonna have to leverage some additional technologies there, uh, fMRI specifically. So one of the benefits to EEG research is it's more um, temporally spatially uh, linked. So we can actually monitor what's happening live, but where fMRI or even you know, uh, uh, other technologies allow us specifically to get more detailed representation of uh, deeper cortical areas. So I, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I, I don't know that we can necessarily map the specific areas within Broadman's region. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah. If um, uh, Stephen, if you have more uh, follow-up questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we'll bring, bring them back up. Uh, and then our second quick question before we move on is uh, what limitations and challenges exist actually for capturing uh, psychophysiological data during performance in extreme environments? This uh, a uh, question attendee asked about, specifically about skydiving and what challenges exist and will these always be present with the technology? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, and you, you uh, just kind of stealing my thunder a little bit on that question only because, you know, as, as we're transitioning to the applied world, I think you just hit the nail on the head. This, this is arguably the, the most difficult aspect of applied research is trying to filter the noise from what is really fundamentally um, happening with the individual. So as an example, uh, one, one area, one biosensor or one area of focus that we might dive into would be heart rate variability. Heart rate variability allows us to look at the level of activation or the, the, the nice dance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And uh, since the sympathetic nervous system certainly kicks in when we're under stress, the parasympathetic nervous system kicks in to try to help bring us back down to a homeostatic state. And so this balancing act that occurs is really important. Now, we also know that the uh, that heart rate variability or HRV is, is very sensitive, it's, it's finicky. So for example, if I'm just sitting here nice and calm and I stand up, I'm gonna have a significant reduction in my heart rate variability, which suggests that on some level, uh, either my cardiac output, the, the total peripheral resistance, the uh, parasympathetic, excuse me, the sympathetic nervous system has activated, right? So now it might take 15 or 20 seconds if I remain stationary while standing for my heart rate variability to come back down to baseline, but, but it's very sensitive. So, so it makes it difficult. So to answer your question, I think what we need to do is to truly under benign conditions, 
measure as many variables as possible that are, are relevant and then hold those in a controlled way post applied research. So for example, if we're talking about, um, uh, I, I think you said a, a skydiver, is that? So if we're talking about a skydiver, so maybe we look at a number of factors when that athlete is in a relatively neutral condition, maybe sitting comfortably, right? So we can look at heart rate variability while they're sitting comfortably. We can uh, look at their blood pressure, et cetera. We might even look at some EEG activity, uh, EMG muscle activation, et cetera. So we can look at all of those factors. Now we get a better sense of where they are at baseline. Then we might expose them, let's say, to a couple of images of someone skydiving to see what kind of reaction they have just visually. Then we can get them into their real world environment, allow them to dive, and then let's take a look. And now, now we have three different windows that we can start to make some comparisons. And that will help us paint a better picture of what's happening with that athlete in vivo, if that, if that makes sense. Nam, you had a question? Actually, no, I just wanted to, to comment on that. Specifically with skydiving is just like, it, it kind of highlights the importance of uh, being able to transition from like lab-based experiments, we have great control. So you could do things like fMRI and things like that, nail down your approach and your methodologies that you know will activate that area, and then sort of approach more sort of uh, realistic scenarios out in the field. Uh, skydiving specifically, yeah, starting with videos would be like a definitely a great place in order to sort of generate that 360 videos. Uh, but actually uh, in iMotions, we actually have a really compelling VR scenario uh, where someone skydives. We can show like that, you know, as that person jumps off that plane in the video, and you're in VR that you can see that that changes in heart rate and GSR uh, that's associated with that feeling and then you know then we can address those challenges as it goes further and further into uh, more realistic scenarios and interesting things like uh, the vibration and such like that uh, but by building that that sort of methodology from from lab to to real world you can then account for some of the uh, the, the drawbacks of, of the noise and stuff that might come into play on the field yeah absolutely uh, thank you for adding that it's a great point yeah. Excellent. So, uh, Dr. Mann, we have another question for you. Uh, for some, for someone who may be newer to working with sensors, what are the challenges in working with this type of data in this context, and how did you overcome them? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think that the, the biggest challenge is really doing your homework on the front end to better understand what exactly are you trying to glean from integrating these sensors. Uh, because the, the human system, the human body, the body is so complex and it's so integrated, it's very hard at times, especially from an applied perspective, as we were just talking about, to really uh, pull out some meaningful, meaningful information. So with that being said, I would say really hone in on what you think are the one or two variables that are going to be most important. And then as much as possible, now this might sound, you know, just as basic as can be, but really it's about pilot testing and testing and understanding what the data is telling you in the most benign situations first, master that environment. Once you have that figured out, then you can take it to the applied, to the applied context. So I would say that's probably the biggest thing. The, the second, uh, I, I would say one of the second biggest challenges that I've had to overcome in, in taking these sensors to an applied arena is getting some, you know, the athlete or coach buy-in. Um, I think that's, yeah. that's another, another big challenge. And the reason for that is, in many cases, depending on the sensors, depending on what kind of data you're collecting, the, the post-processing time can, can be, it, can, it can take a, a lot of time and resources to, to get it to a meaningful point. And so coaches, especially high-level coaches, they, they want their data yesterday. So one, I, I would argue the other challenge is, is having a process streamlined up front so you can process that data quickly. And, uh, and, and I, I don't mean this as a, in, in, a, a plug in any way, but I think this is really where iMotions and this type of platform comes in really nicely. Thank you. Because what it allows us when we're integrating these sensors is to get the data from a raw data perspective to a meaningful interpretive state very, very quickly. Um, and it saves, saves countless hours of, uh, countless man hours of, of data processing. So, I, so I, I apologize if that felt like a shameless plug. That wasn't the point. Um, we will take the plug. We will take the plug. Thank you so much for the plug. I would certainly argue that's critical. So th those would probably be two of the biggest challenges that I that I think that I faced at least is getting getting user end buy in, uh, and then the third part of that buy in piece would be from is helping the athletes understand that 
by collecting this data, we're not using them as guinea pigs as much as we're trying to gather information to help them perform better. And part of, part of the way to do that is to get that information turned around quickly so they can better understand what is happening with them. Um, yeah. I would say I, that, that's been a tough lesson learned. I, when I first got into this, this space, it took me some time. I, I, was, I was energetic and robust and felt really confident what I was able to do. And I didn't get the data turned around quickly. And, uh, I, and unfortunately, that, I think that lost um, some respect for some of the athletes. However, lesson learned is figuring out your solution on the front end translates into better results on the back end and greater usability. Mm -hmm. Uh, Kate, I believe we have uh, another poll that's coming up right now. Yeah, um, so those are the formal questions that we had for Dr. Mann, but I see there are a few more in the chat, so I'm going to get to them. Um, but before I ask the next question, I just want to ask how we can follow up with attendees. If you're listening and you want to learn more, if you're still curious about things we haven't answered, um, there's two ways to reach out. Please um, uh, submit your answer on this poll that I'll show right now. And then also you can always email us at marketing at imotions.com. Uh, but let me launch this poll just to find out how we can follow up with you. Um, and while I do that, I would love to hear, um, Dr. Mann, there's a question from the audience where they're wondering about sporting competitions. Is it actually forbidden to do biosensor measures, like during the Olympics, for example? What are the regulations that are in place to be able to do these kinds of assessments? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, unfortunately, I am not, I cannot speak to the Olympics per se. Uh, my, most of my focus right now has been with the NCAA. And uh, currently, for example, uh, one, one modality we use is the, uh, the Polar Team Pro. And there are currently are not restrictions for collecting heart rate data during competition. In fact, our men's and women's soccer teams, uh, men's and women's lacrosse teams, um, all wear heart rate monitors during training and competition. And those heart rate monitors allow us to collect a number of variables, including distance traveled, uh, speed zones, et cetera. Uh, but we can also start to gather um, their heart rate data, time spent in heart rate zones, heart rate variability based on post-processing, et cetera. But uh, at the moment, I, I, I would hate to mislead you, so I'm not sure what the IOC policy is on that. Cool, but I think that gives good guidance to understand what the sort of limitations are. Um, awesome, I'm gonna leave the poll up for a few more seconds so that everyone gets a chance to vote. Um, but we have another question from the audience about how would you recommend people get started if they're new to this? Are there certain sensors that are best for um, beginners? What sort of recommendations do you have for people who are applying this for the first time? Yeah, great question. Um, if I could just volley back for a second, I would say what, what area are you interested in studying? Um, is it cortical processing? Or are you looking at just some basic psychophysiological processing like heart rate or heart rate variability, EMG, what, what kinds of things are you looking at first? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, that was not specified in the chat, but I do think that you're, you're completely right. Research design and studies um, who, where you kind of have to figure out what your parameters are first kind of leads itself to the type of biosensors you would want to use. Yeah, agreed. And, you yeah. know, and that being said, I, I, if I could offer this, go back to the old KISS acronym, you know, keep it simple, stupid. And, uh, and, I, and I have to live by this every day. I have a colleague that gives me a hard time. I, I, I like to be big picture thinking and capture everything under the sun and it makes, for a, it, makes it muddy, it makes it difficult to process. So I think the, the simpler we can keep our, our question, the simpler we can keep our design, makes it cleaner for the application of the sensor. You know, for example, you know, heart, rate, heart rate research has been around forever. Um, and so, Many people don't feel it's as sexy anymore because it's it's been around for so long. But uh, I'll be honest with you, good heart rate research um, tells us a lot. It, it gives us an indication of stress response. So not only from a physiological load perspective, but if we're also pay, paying attention to heart rate variability, it gives us a good indication of the psychological stressors that an athlete might be going on or experiencing rather in addition to the physical load that they're experiencing. So, so I think, Simple is always best. Um, even something as simple as EMG activity, uh, that, that, could, that could really be a great tell. So anyway, I, I, I think the question to, to, to Kate's point, know what it is you're trying to figure out first, 
keep it as simple as possible. Um, and then, then, then we could really talk specifics about some modalities. Great. Thank you. Um, just a reminder, if you do have more questions, please drop them into the chat right there and we'll service them. We have about um, 15 minutes left, so we want to make sure that we get to all your questions. So I'm going to surface one here. Um, the question is, Dr. Mann, have you used facial expression analysis in your research? Yes. And if fact, so, how? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great question. Um, we have a, a couple of projects that are going on right now. We're using Affectiva to, uh, to help with this process. And, and primarily, be, because what we're trying to do is avoid you know, being overly invasive. So for example, with, uh, with golf putting, uh, really trying to understand what the athlete is experiencing uh, in the moments leading up to that golf putt. Not necessarily while they're standing over it, but potentially while they're evaluating, while they're reading the putt, et cetera. So we're capturing facial expressions to see what types of emotions are being experienced. If you're at all familiar with Paul Ekman's work, um, which is pretty fascinating to me, you know, there's the, the reliability of facial expressions connected to the underlying emotion being experienced is pretty robust. And of course, you know, some of us have a good poker face and we can, we can mask what we're feeling, but those micro expressions, um, what we can capture, I think are really telling. So, so in fact, we're, we're using that with, uh, with a golf putting uh, study right now. Great, that sounds fascinating. Thank you. Um, looks like we have um, gone through all the questions that we have. So um, audience members, again, if you have any other questions, please drop into the chat. And then Nam or Dave, do you want to ask Dr. Mann anything else uh, for the moment? Or do you want to elaborate on anything that we've covered? Nam. Absolutely. So uh, Dr. Mann, um, what are you most excited about uh, sort of in the future in terms of like upcoming uh, frontiers for the, this type of research and the way that it's going? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I think for, for me, there's there's three areas really that that are are still fascinating. Sport vision training to me, as I alluded to earlier, it's 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 sexy, it's novel. There's a lot of unknowns. Um, we we have a, a an applied, or excuse me, a more uh, controlled type of study going on right now that's looking at sport vision training and its effect on athletic performance. And in this case, we have a decision-making task with football, and we also have a putting task in golf. And so we have two, two, two groups that are going, we have a control group that is um, essentially doing a pre-test and post-test on a series of sport vision training devices, including NeuroTracker and Synaptech. So NeuroTracker measures the ability for multiple object tracking, and Synaptech measures a variety of um, visual tasks, including visual reaction time, near far quickness, depth perception, et cetera. Um, and so we're, we're looking at now, if, if an athlete goes through a three or a five week training period using these types of tools, are they better post-training than they were pre-training? So we have both, again, golf and football study going on. Um, so I would say sport vision training is one. Another area that I think is really key, and I touched on this um, just talking about some trends, and that is sort of athlete well-being and recovery. So one, one area that has been fascinating to me, and we've, we've done a couple of studies at Jacksonville University with our athletes, and that is looking, applying technologies like heart rate monitors for looking at heart rate variability pre and post competition. Um, we've also engaged with uh, some sleep tracking technology using MFIT, which is a device that slides under the, the, the athlete's mattress. And so what's nice about that is we can look at the level of recovery that's happening during sleep in not only from a heart rate variability perspective, but we can time spent in respective sleep cycles, the total duration of sleep, et cetera. Um, so to me, athlete recovery is, is key. But fundamentally, what most coaches focus on is training load. And of course, training load is critical. But I think what's really critical that we, and we don't spend enough time on this, is the perception of my load. So for example, you, Nam, you and I may go through the exact same training load and you might come out on the other end feeling revived and invigorated and ready to go. And I might come out on the other end of that feeling exhausted and overwhelmed. Now, what's the difference? Is there a physiological difference? Am I, is my body just really not responding well? Maybe, and, and we, can, we can understand that through some biosensors, but there might also be the perception of how I'm viewing that training load, right? And if it comes from a purely psychological perspective, now we can start to see some influences on uh, on our motivation. Uh, we may see through bio using biosensor technology changes in heart rate variability, time spent 
in a sympathetic state versus a parasympathetic state, meaning there's more dependency in one or the other. So I think there's a second area um, that is that is certainly um, very fascinating to me. So so th those are some of the things that that I would hone in on um, in particular. And I, I think that the third is the perception and action. I think perception and action to me is is really where we have an opportunity to help really good athletes become almost great athletes much quicker. So without overstating it, I think there's an element of if we take a near expert, I think we can get them to expert status faster by helping them to understand and identify the relevant cues in the environment to focus in on um, and how to manage the stress. Because as we think about the relationship between emotion and attention, as I become more stressed or overwhelmed in my performance environment, hence the threat that I was talking about earlier, if I'm in that state, my attentional breadth narrows. And now, does that ultimately result in me compensating for or missing relevant cues in the environment? Uh, if that's the case, I'm going to underperform. So, so I think the perception and action paradigm is a third area that uh, I want to continue to, to investigate and apply more specifically to our athletes. I'll give you an example if we have a minute to, 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 to share where, where this comes into play. So I had an opportunity to work with uh, one of our, our athletic teams on campus, in particular was the lacrosse team. And the lacrosse player was a great athlete, uh, but unfortunately, this athlete wasn't able to fully take advantage of their athletic ability. So in other words, they weren't making good decisions in, at the right time, and oftentimes had to, to compensate for a lack of good decision-making on the field athletically. So the coaches were, were at a bit of a crossroads. Do, do we... Do, do we continue to play this athlete and hopefully the athlete gets to this point or do we have to make a substitution? Well, what we ended up doing was using our eye tracking device. So we used the, the, the Toby Pro. We brought the Toby Pro out on the field and we had the athlete wear the, the, the device during complex decision-making tasks in training. And so what we were able to find very quickly is the athlete, and it should really be no surprise, was focusing on the wrong things. In particular, as the play was developing, the athlete was focusing too much on the defender that was standing close, closest to that person and the ball. And they weren't reading how the formations were developing, you know, outside of those two key points. And as a result, decision making was slow and reaction time was compromised. We ultimately, for athletics, want to eliminate the need for reaction time and increase the window for movement time. And this athlete who moves very quickly was head and shoulders better than most but was behind the eight ball because the athlete just wasn't picking up on the relevant cues. So, so to me, that's where per, the, the perception and action comes in. We taught what to focus on the critical cues based on some plays and the athlete got better as a result. That's really interesting. Um, I wanna just signal that we have uh, about five minutes left. So we have time for about one more question, but um, just to let you know, again, if you, uh, would like to view this webinar again, you will receive the recording um, tomorrow in about 24 hours. But yes, we also have some upcoming webinars that we would love for, to, for you to attend live. You can see them all on imotions.com slash events, but we have two upcoming next week that we're really excited about. One is about um, doing research at home with iMotions, especially during this coronavirus period. It might be hard for you guys to get people into the lab. It might be actually not allowed um, because of social distancing. So how can you actually conduct some behavioral coding and facial expression analysis from home? That's going to be next Wednesday. And then on Thursday, we're also going to be talking about our iMotions API, which is actually really relevant to sports training if you want to integrate third-party hardware that doesn't integrate necessarily um, natively with iMotions, but we can bring in extra data sets. Um, so sign up for those and you'll get the recording. And on that note, I want to just ask the last question we have time for, which is, have you tested the performance of multiple people playing at the same time, Dr. Mann? Um, is that possible? What would you recommend? If so, what tool did you use? And the sort of behavior changes you might have noticed in that scenario, um, focusing, stress decreasing, et cetera, but just wondering if that's possible to do multiple people at a time. Uh, yeah, fan fantastic question. I think again, the, the the type of sensor you're using and your your capacity is what matters. So, for example, um, the answer, well, well, simple answer is yes. We've been able to do that with Polar Team Pro. Um, and just not to digress here, but to to Katie's point about the API. So we're actually able to use the Polar Team Pro 
And because of the, the, the interface, we can bring in the polar data into iMotions be, as a result of API, which is, which is great. In that webinar we'll talk more about that. But, uh, but to go back to that point, yes, we're, we're able to, if you're not familiar with Polar Team Pro, it's really fascinating. It's, uh, it has a docking station. You can, we, we've connected up to, uh, to 30 athletes uh, simultaneously. The information comes in live via an iPad, so we can actually monitor the, the load that the athlete's experiencing. Uh, to answer your point about, you know, sort of in, in competition, in vivo, have we been able to, to use it? Well, one of the things we were starting to look at was the respective recovery time. So, for example, if, if there was a stoppage in play, so let, let's say it's, you know, um, late, late in the, the second half of the game. So athletes are tired. They've experienced a lot of stress, you know, maybe some heat stress, high volume of, of performance, et cetera. And there's a stoppage in play, ball goes out of bounds. We, we would look at that and say, okay, what level of recovery is this athlete getting to in that 20 or 30 second window? And if they don't appear to be recovering quickly, so we might expect a five or 10% shift in heart rate within that 20 or 30 second window. If that's not occurring, based on what we would traditionally see with that, that athlete, it might allow for coaches to make a better decision about substitution. Right, so fatigue, excessive, excessive fatigue might be happening where there's a, a lack of recovery occurring. So we've been able to do, you know, things like that um, as an example. The I would say from a, a, a large volume of of observation simultaneously, Polar Team Pro has probably been the best the best resource for us. Great. Um, if you guys want to hang out for one a couple more minutes, we can actually ask one final question. Um, so let's find one that we have. Um, what are your considerations or pre preliminary results on multiple object tracking via a neuro tracker and its transfer to soccer skills? I'm not sure if that's something that you could answer, but I uh, would love to hear it if you can. Yeah, for sure. So, so we haven't tested neuro tracker with soccer players specifically yet. However, the preliminary data we have on neuro tracker is the, the group that went through the experimental condition, so the actual neural tracker training that we set up, their neural tracker performance is significantly better um, post test than it was pre test. Now, again, how is that going to translate into actual performance? So, in this one study in particular, the closest thing would be with our football players. And our football players were tasked with looking at a, an offensive formation. Uh, so basically a playbook, if you will. They, they were exposed to that offensive formation, and these are football players, so they would have experience with this. They would see the playbook. Then they, they would be exposed to the, to the formation for 10 seconds. Then they would have to identify from four options the best defor defensive formation to uh, counter that offensive set. So what we found was there wasn't much of a change necessarily in response accuracy post-test with the football players, but the response time was much faster. So the football players pre-test the post-test control and experimental perform similarly in terms of how accurately they, they picked the best choice. But the difference was in this case, they were much faster. And what we also found from an, an eye tracking perspective is that the athletes um, spent more time. So they, they went to an object quicker they, they were able to process that information faster. And if it wasn't relevant to them, they moved off to the more correct response quicker and they spent more time looking at it. So in other words, I, now, now the practical inference from that research to me is that we, in a game like football, especially one of the great changes across uh, levels of performance, is not the complexity of the game as much as it is the speed of the game. Now, of course, elite level collegiate and elite level uh, professional football, obviously there's more complexity to that as well. I would certainly wouldn't disagree with that. But if we can process that information faster, now again, we are better set to respond more appropriately rather than having to make up some com compensatory uh, behaviors or decisions down the line. So, it's a, so there's some preliminary results. It'll be interesting to see once the full study is completed what that looks like. Well, that's a great question. 
Okay, great. On that note, uh, we are out of time. So I just wanted to thank you again, Dr. Mann, for being with us and Nam and Dave for being the fountains of knowledge that you are. Um, and for everyone else attending this webinar, we really appreciate your questions and uh, your enthusiasm for sports performance with biosensors. Again, if you have questions we didn't get a chance to answer and you're still curious, you can reach out to us at marketing at imotions.com. You can even request a custom demo that we would do live for your use case at imotions.com slash request demo. And then Dr. Mann's email is there too on the slides if you want to um, connect directly with him. So on that note, thank you. Thanks everyone for being here and uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Bye.